Okay. Um, so thanks very much for your patience, everyone. We're a couple minutes late starting. Um, but welcome to our webinar, Saving Seed Seeding Culture. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Steph Hughes, and I'm the Regional Coordinator in Atlanta, Canada for the Bowda Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. Uh, by now, many of you will be familiar with our program. It's a national program which aims to increase the quality, quantity, and diversity of seed that's grown ecologically and organically across Canada. So the program was launched in 2013 thanks to the championship of Mrs. Gretchen Bowda and the generosity of the W. Garfield Weston Foundation. Uh, we owe them our thanks as we continue in this, our fourth field season of promoting and advancing resilient regional seed systems. Uh, we're lucky to have the guidance of two national partners on this program, USC Canada and Seeds of Diversity Canada. Uh, so please do check them out online and see the amazing things that they're doing for savers across the country. This is our second webinar uh, of our series, Seeing Seed from Every Angle. So we developed this series out of a recognition for the many roles that seeds play in our lives, from sustenance to livelihood to being part of our family, social, and cultural lives. Uh, we wanted to take advantage of an opportunity this year to look at seed through a lens that's broader than just production and really celebrate the seed in a number of different ways. Um, so here's a peek of what we've done uh, so far this year and what's coming up with this uh, webinar series. You can find full details on our website, seedsecurity.ca. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us for the next two in the series. To date, we've uh, completed about 11 webinars, and all of these recordings are available online. So you can access hours of high-quality seed education by visiting our website, seedsecurity.ca, and the exact links are up on your screen now. Um, so we're recording this webinar as well, and once it's complete, it will be added to the list of available videos. One thing that I wanted to mention that's new this year is that our friends in the USA, the Organic Seed Alliance, are also doing their own webinar series this year. Uh, they're underway with a six-part seed production series. Like ours, their webinars are totally free of charge and simply require you to pre-register. Um, so you can head on over to their website and check them out. There's three left in the series uh, on seed quality, uh, cleaning and record keeping, and seed contracting. So I'm sure all of those will be great. The three that they've already completed are also available as recordings. So if you get in touch with them, you'll be able to uh, watch those as well. If you're having any technical uh, difficulties hearing us, uh, you might want to adjust your speaker. So you can do that with the speaker volume icon at the top of your screen or through your computer speaker settings at home. Um, if you've tried that and you're still having technical trouble, just shoot me a little note in the chat pod and I will provide you with a conference line that you can use for audio. So I'm really pleased to welcome, uh, with some of that intro out of the way, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, our speakers for today's webinar. Uh, Terry Lynn and Shani are first time webinar presenters with us and I'm really looking forward to hearing their stories. Um, Shani Singh is going to start us off with seed insights from Nova Scotia to Navdanya and then we'll hear from Terry Lynn Brandt on food and seed in Haudenosaunee culture. Um, so first, I'll just introduce Shawnee a little bit more fully here. Um, so Shawnee Singh is a young farmer from Nova Scotia with a passion for food security and activism through the arts. Shawnee spends her winters at Dr. Vandana Shiva's Earth University, uh, Navdanya. Today she'll be bringing us stories from Canada and India in celebration of seed and small scale farming. Um, so thanks very much Shawnee for being here. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone. So again, I'm Shawnee, and I, I was—I've been thinking um, when starting and talking about what you do. It's really nice to start from the root of where you got started. Um, so I think for me, it really started about uh, five years ago. My family went for the first time um, back to India, where other than my grandparents, all of my family members still live in this very small, very untouched village called Surya. And because it's, it's a little bit further away, it's about seven hours away from Delhi, it, it has this, this culture that is still very rich. And I, what I really not acknowledged was that farming wasn't something separate. It was very much a part of the daily life and ritual. So these are my cousins. Uh, they were stealing sugar cane during Naughty. I think another really um, big piece of that trip was also having the opportunity to meet Dr. Vandana Shiva. And in that time of meeting her, I think the one thing that my sister and I really took to heart and came away with 
was her saying that one of the largest social justice acts one can do is save seed and uh, farm small scale. And so when my sister and I came home, um, we teamed up with a friend and farmer um, in our community, Cami Harbottle, who at the time uh, was just having her first baby. He was about six months old. And she was in the heart of the farming season. And so we would come whenever she needed us, usually once or twice a week, to help with her CSA. And uh, we would help her farm. Shawnee, I'm going to just interrupt okay. for a sec. I've gotten a message that the audio is a little bit light for a couple of participants. If you could um, maybe speak up a bit or take yourself off speaker and just speak directly into the phone, it, may, it might help. Sure. Is that, is that a little better off speakerphone? Participants, can you hear Shawnee pretty well? Is that better? Uh, yes, okay, perfect. Sorry about Great. that. No problem. Um, yeah, no, okay. Um, yeah, and so I, I really felt as a, as a young person, my, I was 15 at the time, I felt that having, not only was it helping Cami, it was also giving me a, a sense of purpose and place by learning how to, to grow my own food. Um, and now being, uh, for the last five years of, of growing food, I think also there's the realization that food is one of, uh, it, it connects everyone. Everyone eats, everyone needs to eat, and it also connects you to every world issue. And that can be quite daunting at the time, I find. And so what I really appreciate and value is that if you are coming together as, as food activists, you come together as community. And the more multi-aged, the better. So um, now I'm going to speak about some, a place that's also very dear to my heart, Navadanya, which is located in the foothills of the Himalayas. And it's Dr. Vandana Shiva's um, Earth University. And so for the last four years, my father and I have gone there to teach a course um, called A to Z of Organic Ecology. Um, so Navdanya is, is a place for food activists and uh, farmers to come and, and do research and learn together. Uh, in this photo, they're making a biodynamic compost. Um, Navdanya is 27 acres of land that are dedicated to seed saving. Um, I'm usually there during the rice harvest, and at that time, um, there's about 700 different varieties of rice that are still being saved uh, based on seed keepers seeing that it was a value to keep their traditional seeds alive. Um, this is uh, Bija Didi, and uh, so she, that means seed sister. And she has been, uh, she's one of the longest uh, working at Navdanya for the last 20 years she's been with them, but she's also uh, been seed saving since she was a small child. Um, over throughout um, India, not just at Navdanya, um, but all throughout India, they have started creating seed banks that are, uh, there's about almost 200 um, in different areas all around India. Um, and the only thing about these seed, seed banks is that they want people to keep their traditional seeds alive. And so anyone can join. Uh, you just have to put in 25 of, of the seeds, 25% uh, of the seeds that you took from the next year, or you can give them to another farmer um, with the, with the um, acknowledgement that you are transitioning to going organic. So like I said, there was, there was almost 200 seed banks over India. In October, while I was uh, working there, um, we were called in a little bit more of an emergency to Punjab, about three hours away from Dehradun, where the university is. Um, and in the first week of October, what was recorded was 15 farmers took their lives when a common pest, um, the white fly, took over 1.3 million acres of cotton, Bt cotton. This is a farmer, and actually, uh, I couldn't find the correct photo, but um, there, there were even more pesticides um, in when I visited this farm. And uh, he, this is just the amount of pesticides that he'd spray in uh, 
three, three months of the cotton's growing season. And even though he was spraying all of these pesticides, it wasn't enough to, um, to kill off the, the white fly. Uh, glyphosate was also uh, here on his farm. And uh, when we asked him if he knew about the health risk, uh, he told us that he did not know. Um, six of the main um, railways were, were completely blockaded during this protest. Um, farmers b blockaded um, for about a week and a half, just wanting compensation for the yields they had lost. One woman um, had taken her life when she had gone to the fields to see that everything was completely destroyed. And what she would, or the debt she killed herself over would have been $50 Canadian. This farmer is an organic farmer, and he's been orga an organic farmer for about 13 years. Um, he became organic when he saw the, the connection to pesticides and cancer. Three of his family members died of cancer. It was quite shocking and, and amazing to see that um, he, on his fields, he was growing orga or organic local daisy feed, and it was completely untouched by the white fly. Uh, white fly. Um, and just about a yard away, there was a field that was, um, that was completely destroyed. That was BT uh, cotton. And um, since our, our visit in October, we've heard, Navdanya has heard that seven out of the 10 farmers that we visited have started transitioning over to organics. So now we're going to jump um, back to Canada. So for the last three years, um, the Justice Center for Small Farms has been, um, has, has in uh, Grand Pre has been sort of taking root. Um, we're a farm, uh, we're about an acre of land, and we're dedicated to consumer awareness. Um, we divided the farm into quarters in a way, um, and so one part of the farm is based on farmer-led research. We also have farmers and residents who um, have their own small market gardener. They're a young a family with children, so to have of their own farm right now would be quite um, quite daunting. So they farm and sell at the farmers market, the local farmers market. Um, here um, is the part that I work on. Um, it's a taste education garden. Um, so it gives the opportunity for consumers to come through and try and see where their food is coming from. Um, we also show different ways of uh, farming practices such as permaculture and uh, we're trying the more market gardener uh, Jean-Martin Fortier style of, of growing quite condensed and um, there's also um, companion planting going on. Here's a uh, we were planting uh, some peppers that were um, saving for seed uh, and this is with a, a group based out in Halifax called Hope Bloom which is a school group uh, that are, are making the most amazing school garden. Um, so on our farm, we really, we really want to talk a lot about healing, healing our connections. And one of the main uh, focuses is we always want to acknowledge that we are on unceded Mi'kma'a Mi'kma land. Um, here we have Shalin Jowdhury, who is um, a poet who came to our festival in August um, called Barry celebrating the works of uh, Wendell Berry. And it was a really wonderful time of people coming together and celebrating um, sort of maybe more the artistic side in agriculture. This is her partner um, doing his daily morning, morning meditation of basket weaving. Um, so again, touching on healing, um, we have a garden, uh, a women's garden, that's dedicated to um, celebrating women in agriculture. I think a lot of the time society doesn't see that um, about 75% of our food um, is going through the hands of women, and a lot of the time that is not acknowledged. Um, and so we also have a breastfeeding bench um, 
overlooking the farm. And we really want to, to acknowledge that um, feeding your child is a human right. And also, we believe that breastfeeding is your first step in food security. Uh, we also offer farmer prenatals whenever the demand is needed. Um, I think that it's really important as a community and a center like this to have open spaces for the multi-generational um, groups to come through um, and learn together here. Um, where our farm is located, we have quite uh, a coastal view, and it can be quite windy. So here we were making a um, living willow fence in the spring, and um, yeah, it was. It's we've had a few different workshops throughout the farm, and we're always trying to have other ideas for for people to to generate, no matter what sc sc um, scale of of farming they they have access to. So here we have just this uh, an example of square foot gardening. Um, a friend of mine from the Cody Institute, he said that this is, was his way um, when his children were smaller to get them to weed. And um, it, he'd get them to weed just three squares, and then they'd get that done in such a short time that um, they'd end up weeding the entire um, raised bed. So we just want to show, yeah, you can, you can farm at whatever scale you're at, um, whether it be a larger organic farm or if it's just a, a potted plant on your windowsill. Um, any of the farm that is not in use, we um, will let it have fallow periods uh, where we'll do cover crops or winter cover crops. Uh, we also have sheep and um, movable fence um, so that uh, it cuts down on mowing and uh, they're, they're quite good at that, the sheep are. We also had a workshop this year um, with Gilbert Dowell a farmer from uh, an Acadian farmer from Clare, and uh, we worked together on um, creating a an insectary. Um, she was saying that she makes these uh, small potted insectaries that are a bit more for emergencies. So if she needs, she can either wheel them around her farm to the places that need more attention from her pollinators. Also on the farm every Earth Day. Um, from the seeds that we saved from, from the year before. So this is buckwheat, and uh, this is actually last year. And the year uh, this year, we uh, did pole beans. Uh, so it, it helps with uh, getting people to touch the earth, to, to plant things that are beneficial for our pollinators. But also, it's uh, that kind of the saving seed and looking forward towards uh, another year of growing. Um, the center is something that I believe is, is, is more of a feeling. You can talk about it all you want, but uh, it's really quite a, a home vibe. And I would hope that everyone could come visit. We are an open space. We have a lending library of books um, that are agricultural and social justice based. Uh, here we have um, had a mead workshop earlier in the year. So we do everything at the center from uh, workshops on fermentation. Uh, we had a, a cheese maker who came through and uh, Sander Katz as well the year before. Um, but like I said, I would really appreciate if anyone was interested to come, come visit us on the farm. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, have a great day. Bye. Shani, thanks so much. That was really great. Um, so we have some time for questions with Shani. If mm -hmm. you guys um, want to type your questions into the chat pod, that would be great. Um, I see a couple of people might be doing that now. Um, Shani, while they kind of get their fingers warmed up, I'm wondering, I've been to the farm at the, at the Just Us uh, Center, and it's a really amazing space, and I was wondering, um, your family has quite a connection with Vandana Shiva and Navdanya, and I was wondering how um, the philosophies at Navdanya have impacted how you guys set up the space at Just Us and um, made it into kind of a holistic learning center. Mm, good question. Um, I'll get off the speakerphone. Um, so basically, the first time we were at 
at Navdanya, the first time we actually went to India as a family, um, I think we were very, we realized that although they had 27 acres, it was something that was very reachable and accessible for anyone to do. And I think that's really what we try and embody on the farm. So by showing people different ways of urban farming, I would love to do more with uh, vertical gardening, um, just just making it um, more reachable for for those, uh, for people. I also find it might not be through Navdanya directly, but um, also just visiting uh, my family's village, a lot of the time people link um, yoga and and India. Of course, it's it's true, but I, I when I'm in like the realest places, uh, the rural villages in India, I don't really see much yoga happening like in class form. It's more just the way people um, work. It's a constant yoga practice of the way you move and the way you, you, from preparing your family's meal and squatting to the way you work in the field, um, that's that's what yoga is. And, and so that's what we try and do here on the farm as well, is just kind of very uh, intentionally moving about uh, about the farm. Wonderful. Um, and I had another uh, question. I see a couple of people type, and then they, maybe they get shy or something. So I'll just mm -hmm. ask uh, my questions in, in, until folks want to jump in. But another thing that was in your presentation um, was uh, a lot of uh, farmers and maybe other Indians holding up signs that said, Farmers' Lives Matter. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if that was uh, something that came about as a direct response to farmer suicides, or if you could give us a little bit more information about that that movement or that campaign? Of course, yeah. Um, so so that kind of stemmed from the person that I was traveling with. And what was, what was quite shocking is while we were there, um, the person that I had been working with was newly hired to uh, work for Navdanya. But before, he had been working for the Hindustan Times, um, which is a news, newspaper. So um, he basically wanted to come up with a tagline. But while we were there, uh, what was quite shocking, in my opinion, was there was no one broadcasting, and no one was, um, no newspapers were there, uh, taking seeing this as something worth documenting. Uh, so we actually went in there, and, and there was sometimes that we would have to almost um, fib, saying that we were we were reporters um, to 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 be allowed on, because um, there were police blockading, kind of. Uh, the protesters, and it was it, it, it was quite in intimidating. But um, basically, his way of realizing that the news wasn't going to cover it was um, Navdanya has a bit of a Facebook page and Twitter, so we had to use other forms of, of media to to get this message out. Uh, so Farmers Lives Matter was born from that. Um, in a, in a hope that more people would, would get more active in, in educating themselves about what was happening, um, not only just, like not in Canada, I'm even meaning just people in Delhi seven hours away didn't know that this was happening to farmers. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. That's really powerful. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, I think what, if I could get you, um, I think what we'll do is we'll move on to Terry Lynn's presentation, um, and Shani, hopefully you can uh, stick around for that, but if you have to sure. leave, we understand. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Before you go, I'm wondering if you could do me a favor and just type into the chat pod the website for Navdanya as well as for the Just Us Center Farm um, so that oh, folks can definitely. check it out uh, later for if they sure. want to. And okay. like I said, if you're ever in the area, please feel free to come by. Um, but yes, I will send off the, the website. All right, thank you so much. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Terry Lynn Brandt. Terry Lynn has a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Education, and a Master's of Science. Uh, she is part of the Mohawk Turtle Clan, and her traditional name is Salah Zala. 
a Haudenosaunee seed keeper. Uh, she lives and works in her home community of Oshawakan Six Nations at the Grand River Territory. For the past 30 years, she has taught junior kindergarten to grade 8. She's been a vice principal and taught Mohawk language and Indigenous science for the Native Teacher Education programs at Brock and Queen's Universities. Sala Zala is a frequent lecturer at various universities and gatherings on a wide variety of topics, from Native education and dreaming to traditional gardening practices and lifestyles. She is a survivalist and lives lightly on Mother Earth, raising four daughters completely off the grid on solar power for 25 years, tending bees, gardens, and her orchard. She has five grandchildren and after passing her house on to one of her daughters, has embraced the gypsy lifestyle as a way of living more sustainably. She's recently started Mohawk Seed Keeper Farm where settlers and original peoples will come together to engage in acts of reconciliation with the earth and with each other. Um, so Terry Lynn has opted to just have her slides kind of play in the background of her talk. Um, uh, Terry Lynn, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, first, I'd just like to do a sound check and see if everyone can hear me okay. Does that sound like a good sound, a level for everyone? I can hear you well, and uh, let's just hold on for one sec and see what folks say as they, as they have to type that feedback in. Okay, so um, just to okay. maybe... Okay, and one person has said louder, please, <laughs> and a okay. bit faint, okay. so feel free to speak up. Okay, um, I just want to start off beginning a little bit about who I am. Um, as a uh, Mohawk person here living in uh, Canada, um, sometimes I still get surprised and, and um, uh, mixed feelings about what little uh, average Canadians know really about our communities and our people and our, our ways of life. Uh, so I thought I'd start a little bit basically about who I am. And as a as you can see from my career, I've spent I basically spent my my entire life in my community. Uh, I was born here. I uh, did go away to school for a little while, but, you know, basically came back and uh, spent generally my entire life here in my community. So when you do that, I uh, mean, you live in a, in a community, it's actually like a cold or a, a closed type of community, remembering that the only people that can live here are other members of our nation. And so, therefore, we don't always get the contact that we do with the outside world. And, and uh, that was one of the things that kind of led me along some of the paths that I've been on lately and just in the most recent years. Uh, as a young uh, person, right from a, you know, being a toddler, I was uh, always next to my what we call Dodo, which is our grandfather, my grandfather. And uh, he used to take his old cane and he used to shove it down my shirt and stick it in the ground. And, and he'd say, talk to me when he was out by the barn and he'd be doing uh, hoeing his potatoes and things like that. So right from uh, a, a very small child, um, I've spent time learning agriculture, learning how to, to tend their foods, how to tend our fields, our animals, and just the way of life of our people that um, has resonated through me throughout my entire life. Um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, have been raised by what I would call the last subsistence farmers in our community, uh, meaning that they didn't have to do anything other than work on the farm or work in their own their own uh, their own land and be able to feed themselves and take care of themselves. Um, and when you're looking through some of my slides, I just want you to every picture that you look at, there's something probably in within that picture that shows you, even though that we do maintain a real strong traditional life here. Um, we are connected to the outside world, and we spend a lot of time contemplating how it is that we fit into that outside world. And even in that picture you're looking at now with my daughter, she's a clothing designer, and uh, you can see on that scarf that she's wearing, the reason I put that in was because of the designs that are on that scarf. Uh, she took those designs from agricultural practices of our people, um, what we call ancient tattoo designs, ancient pottery designs, and all those things, and they, she built them into her clothing line. And um, her, she's an identical twin, and her sister um, is a silversmith, and the two of them have a company called Twins in the De Designs, where they, they make clothing and jewelry for everyone. And But the reason that they were able to do those things is because they knew so much about who they were from being raised as children, always knowing uh, where they come from, 
uh, where they're going, and by knowing who they were, um, I've always they've been very strong um, young Mohawk women. They, you know, they've always felt that they could do whatever um, they wanted to do here, being raised here. They never really feel like that they were done hard or couldn't do anything because they always had that agricultural spirit within them. And anybody that has an agricultural spirit, and you talk about who you are, for us it's so strong that it, it encompasses the very uh, spiritual understanding relationship that we have with the earth. Um, the Haudenosaunee people, um, that is the word that we use for our people. Uh, it, it simply means the people of uh, the longhouse. That refers to the structure, the traditional structure of home that we lived in. So the Haudenosaunee people um, were from the Northeast, and they were agriculturalists. And they're probably the first huge agriculturalists in this, you know, on what we call Turtle Island, which is North America. Um, and as I said before, I was fortunate enough to be raised by my, with my grandparents, my parents, my aunts, my uncles. All these people were all agriculturalists, so we maintain a lot of a lot of uh, the practices and the ways that we grow our things. And having done that, having becoming agriculturalist, if anybody, and I'm sure everybody that's listening is some kind of a gardener, you all know that it's difficult work. It's hard work, and it's hard, that, and it's work that you cannot just leave and let go. Something that you always got to be tending. You always got to be mindful of the weather, the, the cycles, the way the water is running, the way the wind is blowing. All these things are important. And all these energies come together and they create a resilience and they create a connection for those people that are gardeners. And, you know, you may have 50 people in a room listening to lectures about gardening, but at the end of the day, there's probably only two real gardeners in there. Those people that for whatever reason, they're just connected to that soil, they're connected to those plants and they need, they need to to uh, continue on in that path. And as a young person learning agriculture uh, from my ancestors, I've always had that uh, um, connection. Now, not all my brothers and sisters, although they had to help in the fields and do the work, they didn't all get that same connection. Uh, and for Haudenosaunee people, even though um, some of us are more connected to it than others, we all march to a certain beat of a drum, so to speak. Our entire universe and world cycles around agriculture, everything that we do. And by that, what I mean is our ceremonial calendar is based on agriculture. Seeds are extremely important in our community. Um, we start our agricultural year with ceremonies that talk to us about the cleansing of the earth, about the ashes. It's a called stirring the ashes, which is a type of ceremony that we do. And we actually do those things in a symbolic purification of Mother Earth. She sat and been resting for a long time, but when midwinter time comes, it's time for us to make sure that we stir those ashes. And it's a practice in our community that we still use our ashes and we put them on our fields. Um, they're, we know that they're pesticide, you know, they help with the pests but they also help clean the soils. And it's important that we take our time before we put our seeds in to make sure our Mother Earth is cleaned. And so everything that we do in our, in our agricultural calendar or ceremonial calendar is based on preparation for the foods that we're going to be eating and the plants that we're going to be putting in the ground. Um, not many of us really take the time to germinate, um, as you will see, you know, you know, a lot of people are very, uh, um, interested or they make sure that they start all their plants indoors and then, you know, start them outdoors. Um, I really, I'm not a proponent of that. It's just because it's something traditionally we really didn't do a heck of a lot of it. Although I have read um, references to the 1600s where the Haudenosaunee people actually did have transplants within their longhouses and, and uh, were trying to transplant way in the 1600s. So it wasn't something new to us. It is something that we did do. Um, in the pictures, you'll see our corns. We have so many beautiful varieties of corns. Um, and one of the things in our agricultural calendar is that as the moons change throughout the year, we honor a different aspect of what's happening in creation, what's happening in our field, what's happening in agriculture. So as we go, and it's almost getting time to plant, 
We take time and we honor our seeds. We have a ceremony just for seeds. Everybody comes to Longhouse. Everybody brings their little bundle of seeds with them. They acknowledge them. They, we take time because so often people take those seeds and they put them in the ground and, you know, just wait for them to grow. But there's not that, that sense of saying meow or thank you to them to, for them to continue in their responsibility like a responsibility given to them by creation. And it's really important that for my people that we do that. We have a, a life belief and a world philosophy that when, as long as we continue to do the ceremonies that were given to us by our creator, as long as we continue to do those things, then the earth itself will continue to survive. We believe that when we stop doing them, then the earth will no longer continue. So every one of the ceremonies as they start to come up after, you know, even our, as I say, in our seed ceremony, what we sing, we learn, we, everyone stands up and everyone takes their turn in our in our ceremonies where they have gone and they've meditated, they've prayed, they've asked the Creator to send them a song. So each person stands up and they're able to sing their seed song. And the seed songs are, gen, are sung by the women because it is women who are what we call the, the women are in charge of gardening and they are seeds because we know that seeds came to us through the what we call sky woman the first woman being that descended to turtle island to this earth had in her hands clasped in her hands seeds from the sky world and we knew that she brought them she nurtured the world she created it she made it big and she planted her seeds so we know that female the female spirit is very, very critical and important in gardening. For us, that is our role. We have our, our head corn matrons, so is it direct traffic to make sure that everybody's pulling and doing their own equal part. And all these things help us generate a strong nation. We have a real, um, uh, such a strong belief in our creation. Like for me, I'm, I'm not been a, a waterer of my garden. Uh, my garden, I know there's been a drought this year, but my garden's doing quite well. Um, I was just, you know, out there picking. I had about a bushel of tomatoes I picked out today, you know, and looking, the corn's coming along, the onions, like everything is just coming along and doing as it should. Um, and the reason for that is because we have, we take all of our time to do our ceremony, to have faith in creation and the creator, because he always said that he'll put things, everything that we need is put here on this earth. So we know that he's always going to be providing for us those things. Uh, we do take time when we when we do our ceremonies for the sun and for the rains and all those things to thank them for continuing the responsibility that was given to them. Um, so with my people, as we go along, we will do a ceremony for the beans when they come up available. You know, when they come through, and we have a special food that we soup that we make and that we share, and then we sing our songs and do our dances with. You know, we'll go through as as the raspberries and as the different things come available throughout the season, we make sure that we get we all gather and we partake of those foods and, and we do ceremony for them. And at the end of the season, again, we bring everything together and thank creation for having all those. We also ask um, that at the end when the season is done and we're putting everything away, we tell, you know, we thank the, the, the earth itself again for saying, you know, for providing for us, for continuing in the responsibility that the Creator sent us. And for us, seeds are so important that it really hurts us very deeply when we look at what people have done to seeds. We always had beautiful, beautiful seeds. And, and my family, the seeds that I carry, I'm very fortunate, as I say, because I came from a long line of, of, uh, of growers that I maintain the corns and the beans and the bushes and the seeds, seeds that we've had forever, and we keep growing those things. And I'm fortunate and happy that I, I don't have to go to the store to buy those seeds because the seeds that are in the store, they're not seeds anymore. Man has taken them and changed them. And there's a word that we use, sa'oyera, which means that it's like Mother Nature. Like, so man has taken that, that essence of seeds and taken away from them the knowledge with which the Creator gave them. He, they've taken it out of the seed, so the seeds aren't able to even grow in the way that they normally would be able to grow. You know, having to 
um, spray them so they can be there, having to, you know, spray them so they can germinate, all these different times that they, in the things, the modifications that they've done to them, that they, it's almost created this little, this little seed here that is nothing like its ancestor. And I fight really hard and I work really hard to make sure that we maintain uh, the seeds that we've had for, for so long. Um, I involve my family as much as possible. We probably be easily 85% of our own diet, you know, whether it's, um, it's food, agriculture, a lot of that comes from there. But, you know, we have fishermen in my family. We have moose hunters, elk hunters. Um, you know, we have so much food that we don't really literally have to even buy our foods from the grocery store if we don't need to. Like, we can survive without that. But as I said at the beginning, because we're in a small, closed community, most people don't know how it is that we live and we work. So in the past few years, I have been trying to open up a little bit more because I have found that there are a lot of uh, non-native people out there who are interested in, in growing the types of foods that we grow, and not just those types of foods, but in the way that we grow them. You know, we, we have our own... Uh, a lot of it is a combination, like we grow by the moon. It's very important in helping us. Uh, we pay a lot of observation, do a lot of observation. Um, I guess you'd call it companion planting, knowing what should be next to what. Pay a lot of close attention to the landscape itself. What's growing where? Where's the water going? How is it running? Which what plant should be in what area? So all these things are observations in their own inherent traditional knowledge that one acquires when you're working with traditional people. So we have had, I have had uh, recently um, opened up some of my uh, uh, gardens where I'm using, allowing non-native people, uh, university students and such like that who are just, you know, who are studying and learning about different types of uh, agricultural practices. And, and I, you know, it was kind of funny, I had some uh, PhD students who were working with corn. And uh, like literally the, these people had been in university for 10 years and they're doing their work, their doctorates in corn. And they came over to my place and we sat there, and there was five of them. And what, all they wanted to do was to plant corn. I thought, I said, okay, yeah, I can show you how to plant corn. So I taught them how. And I was surprised that, I said, so you've been studying in the university for 10 years and you, have, and you don't know how to plant corn. Well, we know all the methods. I said, have you ever planted it? And they said, no. And I said, so how is it that, that, that you develop the, your spirit, your relationship with corn? What, what makes you think that you're allowed to just study it in that manner and that you're, what you're doing is right and good both for you and for the corn? And uh, they had no answer for those kinds of questions. So I know that sometimes we, our agricultural practices allow us to uh, go so far off the beaten path and uh, that our seeds are being taken away from us and turned into something that's not really connecting to our people. Uh, it's not creating good food. It's not creating that spiritual connection as to how it is that we need to eat and do things. So um, I will continue along that path of, uh, of, of helping and allowing people to come and, and um, learn what it is that they need to learn from our people because, it, it, as I say, it becomes more and more, it's more and more of a prominent thing that, that's happening. And the reason I do this is because we're getting, you know, a smaller and smaller group of what we call seed keepers, people who are uh, maintaining seeds and agricultural practices for, from their ancestors. There's getting to be fewer and fewer and fewer of us left in this country. In fact, you know, there's literally, you know, maybe a handful across the country. And uh, as indigenous people, so we feel that we have this great responsibility to to feed and take care of our ancestors, like our people that have gone on before us, and not just us, but the foods and the seeds that have gone on. So um, I really need to, you know, stress upon to people, to anyone who who happens to have heritage seeds and plants like that, maybe they brought them from another country or whatever. You know, I really want to applaud those kind of people because they are so important to us. Uh, and the Haudenosaunee people, we cannot exist if we don't have our foods. Our foods are part of our ceremonies, the seeds that we have, um, the ceremonies that we do, the songs that we have, the dances that we do. All these things are giving thanks to the seeds and the foods that the Creator sent to us. So for us to continue our life and who it is, who we are, we need to continue our agricultural practices. And um, as I said, I'm willing to share those.
relationships with people, and uh, I, I work really hard to uh, uh, make sure my own family has, you know, has a, knows all my children know their agricultural practices, and many of them, and they've grown up to take those that knowledge that they've learned and apply it in the modern world, and uh, make it something that uh, everybody um, that it can make bridge them to the modern world, but it's still they still know their way back home, and that's really important. And I think the same thing happens with seed. Even though they do get changed, I know we're on that, we're on that cusp it right now because I met with the, the Canadian government asked me to go to a meeting in Quebec, and, and we talked about that. And uh, they were, I always thought that they meant there wasn't enough food for people to eat in the world, but what the room for a scientist were really actually saying was the seeds that we've been tinkering with, we can't tinker anymore. We've kind of created these monsters now. So when we say there won't be enough food to feed the world, that's what we mean. So now they're going back to the indigenous people, and it was a meeting with Canada, United States, and South America. Each one, or sorry, Mexico. So each one of those countries talk, took their indigenous people with them to talk about their heritage seeds. And, and uh, you know, it was really uh, an eye-opener for me for to hear scientists and geneticists around the world saying that, hey, you know, we don't know what we did now, but we've got to undo it. So I just hope people take that to heart and remember that and, and, and pay that couple extra pennies if you have to to those farmers that are trying to provide for you. Uh, I call my farming natural farming. I don't really know what the heck organic farming really means, but mine's just natural. It's the way that, that um, you're only using the resources that we have there on the farm the way that uh, we've always done it. So uh, Goa, thank you very much. Okay, um, that's a really wonderful presentation. Thanks, Terry Lynn. Um, we have a few minutes for questions with Terry Lynn as well. We basically set aside a good chunk of time for the webinar, so within that time limit, we'll just kind of go until questions are exhausted. Um, so if, uh, yeah, so participants are invited to write in with questions. And in the meantime, Terry Lynn, I was wondering, um, you mentioned that your role uh, is being a seed, uh, seed keeper, and there are fewer and fewer yeah. of you as time goes on. I wonder if there are particular varieties uh, that you work with that are particularly important to you uh, or your family, your community. Uh, well, basically, uh, the Haudenosaunee people, their staples are corn, beans, and squash. About 62% of the uh, corn that we have, or our, our diets originally were corn, so we do eat a lot of corn. It makes us very healthy people. And uh, so those are basically, and they've been in my family, the seeds that, you know, so um, corns like white corns, blue corns, red corns, calico corns, all the, you know, there's probably a good dozen or so, but there's probably about four or five that I really work with and make sure that because I know like they're Haudenosaunee strands that are coming down. Same thing with the squash, the ones that are coming down, the Haudenosaunee beans that, you know, we've had for a long time. Um, you can see the picture of the girl holding it, those seeds in her hand. That's kind of a, some, uh, is a, a South American or Mexican corn that a friend of mine was growing. Uh, but she carries those because those are uh, uh, like that transition between when the, from the, from the original grass stalk of corn to as it as it um, turned into the corn that we know today, the cobs of corn. So, so basically, it, it's 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 our corns, our beans, our squashes, and yeah, there's probably three or four varieties of each one of those that I really try to that hold near and dear uh, to my heart because they belong to my family and they've always been there. So the varieties um, are they passed? down within families, and are they special for spiritual reasons, um, or is it also kind of agronomic in how they grow on your land? Um, well, they are our staples, okay? They're the things that mm. we've been eaten off of forever and ever. Um, different ceremonies use different types of corn. Like, for example, when the when people get married, we use the red corns with strawberries, and we make a certain kind of cornbread. Uh, the, uh, what we call the Ogi or the um, Bear Society, our Medicine Society people, they use the blue corns into a mush with uh, blueberries and things like that. So different um, uh, varieties of things are, are put into our ceremonies for, you know. I've never actually had it studied. I've seen studies that looked at uh, uh, the chemical breakdown of like white corns. I would like to see the breakdowns of some of our other heritage seeds. Uh, that's something I've always been interested in. 
mind because I kind of think that those things hold within them some kind of special powers. And I, I recently I've been, because I grow uh, blue corn and I provide it for a lot of the society, the medicine societies. And uh, it makes, we make it, in, we ground it into a flour and then you can make it into a bread or soups or whatever they want to do with it. But we all know, we hear all the time on the news, eat blueberries or eat cranberries, eat the really red, dark, fruits and vegetables because, you know, those are the things that have so much good stuff in them. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I bet you it's the same thing And if they were to break down corn. The blue corn probably has different types of n nutrients in it versus the white corn or the red corn or the yellows or the calicos. They, they probably all have their different nutrients, and maybe those blue corns are the ones that are, are better when people are doing healing. I'm not really sure, but um, there must have been a reason why our societies um, develop that, and it's some, one of those kind of things that maybe science can take a look at and to say, well, you know, those Mohawk people, they use this blue corn in their medicine societies. You know, gee, when we analyze it, look, it's really good for certain diseases. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. Mm, yeah. Uh, we have a question from a participant. Silvana and Dottie are on the webinar, and they say, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. A uh, question is, do you think that Mother Earth uh, will reject GMO seeds and GMO crops? No. Well, I think the conditions under which they've gone into the Earth, okay, the Earth is very forgiving. Mother Earth will revitalize itself. But it's not really that she's rejecting them, is that people are putting things into the Earth that is that is creating this environment that the seeds are not, be taking their nourishment from Earth. They're taking it from something else that's being put in there. So Mother Earth is pretty uh, compromising, in, you know, and that she will continue to feed us, but there's, going to, there's this time period where she becomes sterile, you know, because of all the chemicals and things that have been put on it, and there's going to be this, you know, waiting time, you know, that I think some fields are going to have to undergo. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, in the earlier presentation, she was talking about crop rotations and letting the land lie follow. You know, some of those things are going to have to happen. But some of those things, the remediation is some of those things that we're going to have to have creation. What are the plants that we need to put on this soil to help it support it? So GMO seeds and it, the way that they're growing are sterilizing or destroying the earth. We may have to do something to remediate it to get it back to help it get it back quicker. But you know, or or we can wait ten thousand years until it reverts back again. You know, it sounds kind of silly, but literally, there's going to be that time where it can do it itself. It just needs time to do that. Okay. Um, one of my questions for you is, so within our program, we're increasingly doing uh, public education about seed security and seed saving and what it means to be a seed saver. And I wonder if you have any suggestions for us about messages that we should um, try to communicate to people about seeds. Well, I guess the first message is um, what it is that when you're saying you're going to be, a, you're going to take upon this seed saving thing. You know, um, really try to let it become part of you, part of who you are. It's not just something that you go, like you go and buy this package of seeds or you order them from somebody and they're heritage seeds and you're going to keep them and you're going to keep going. But it's turning around and, and doing ceremony with that seed by saying thank you when you put it in the ground for, uh, so that all the conditions, asking for help, asking for the rains to come, asking for the moon to be right, asking for help and support to do these things. Because if if you don't create a relationship with seed. If you don't create a relationship with earth, then it's just a thing, you know. That's how we got into this, into this situation that we're at. And I think that's the biggest thing is that concept of spirit and ceremony in seed saving, in gardening, in putting things in the ground that people have to reclaim. And the other thing is I truly believe it's, it, it, it's the majority culture, like for in my culture, the women are the gardeners. The men support us by their jobs. They get the fields ready. They do all the hard stuff, right? But it's women who actually guide the practices and uh, and do those things. So I think that in the majority culture, if it, when them women start to wake up and realize, you know, we got to be returned to the farm, and that was one. I have a little farm book, and they were talking about how many women are returning, you know, in greater numbers 
numbers. But I think when, when all of agriculture understands that, that it is a female practice, that they're going to naturally create much a much uh, healthier product and much healthier food for their people because women have a tendency to care about what their kids are eating. You know, it's not really always is it the cheapest thing. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's really true. Um, another question from Silvana and Dottie. Uh, these two women live in Nova Scotia and they do some work with uh, wild plants and wild seed saving. And so what they've asked, are there other important plants in your livelihood? Do you work with some wild ones? Well, Haudenosaunee farming, you know, you, they talk about this thing called food forest. Okay, if you just close your eyes and visualize and take yourself back about 600 years and think about what this country looked like 600 years ago. The Haudenosaunee people were are people of the northeastern woodlands. It's all woods where we lived, where we mm. where we planted our things. We looked for little um, open spaces within the the woods, but so it's hard for most people don't realize, you know, when they walk in a in a state park or a provincial park and they oh look at the beautiful trees and everything. Well, the whole country was like that at one time. So when our our people were doing that um, in the the more you look for into those spaces, they'll create those places, you'll start to find the seeds, the things that are important. And it's like anything, uh, my, uh, like I've always been taught by my elders, is that it's things come to you and show themselves. And what they call, they say they present themselves to you. So when you're walking through the bush and suddenly you see one mushroom and then you see, then you look and turn around, oh my goodness, there's a whole bunch, right? It like suddenly popped up there. Okay. Those things are, are part of that spiritual connection. If you were supposed to pick those mushrooms, then those mushrooms know that and they're waiting for you. And, and it's not that you're finding them, it's that they're finding you. And if you can get your head around that kind of a concept, then you'll get a better understanding about your relationship with, with, with agriculture and, and uh, taking things from the forest or taking things from the wild. So the, you don't choose the seeds, the seeds choose you. Yes. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so we have lots of thanks coming in from our participants. I think it's um, almost 5 o'clock Eastern, um, so I think that what we might do is wrap up at this point. Um, I want to very sincerely thank our two presenters, Shawnee and Terry Lynn. Um, thank you so much for being part of today's webinar and for sharing your seed uh, wisdom and your food and farming stories with us. Um, it was really wonderful to hear from you. Um, I also want to thank those of you who took time out of your busy summer season to join us. Um, I'll quickly just announce that our next webinar is happening on October 19th. It's called The Business of Seeds, Some Commercial Considerations, and we'll be hosting Tom Stearns, who will talk about scaling up, Sebastian Aguilar talking about seed contracts and relationships, and finally Patrice Fortier talking about developing a market for regional